This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, brought to you by the Fur Bearers. Eating a plant-based diet is a great way to be healthy and reduce your impact on the environment and climate crisis. But making the change can be intimidating, especially if, like me, you grew up on meat and potatoes. Fortunately, folks like Candace Hutchings are making it easier than ever to eat plant-based. Known by her millions of online followers as the Edgy Veg, Candace is a recipe designer and cookbook author who brings wit and levity to her channels. Beyond accessible, delicious recipes that are a weekly hit in my home, Candace also offers insights on animal advocacy, mental health, and the environment, and how plant-based eating impacts them all. Candace Hutchings, the Edgy Veg, joins Defender Radio to share her journey to becoming a cookbook author, influencer, and why the future will be plant-based. All right, well, let's get started at the beginning of the story. Uh, what's the Edgy Veg story? How, how did we get from your humble beginnings to where you are today? Yeah, so um, it's kind of a weird story, actually. I grew up mostly vegetarian. My mom was vegetarian and vegan in the 80s. Uh, when my parents got divorced, uh, she didn't really have anywhere to live. And so she moved in with a friend of hers who is part of the same religion that my mother is part of, which is Seventh-day Adventist. And I don't know if you know much about them, but their whole um, ethos is like living healthy for Jesus and all this stuff. And that includes being vegetarian. And then as time progressed, also being vegan. Um, they firmly believe that animals are put on the planet as our friends, and that's it. Um, so uh, she moved in with her friend who was teaching the church um, how to live a more healthy lifestyle, and she was making, like, cashew cream in, like, 1988. And so my mother was helping her. Yeah, my mother was helping her doing these cooking classes for people at the church and kind of adopted a lot of those types of um, techniques and the lifestyle and whatever. And so when we were born and we were growing up, she kind of incorporated a lot of those techniques, which is why we grew up mostly vegetarian. And when I went away to college, I kind of, you know, I was eating like some chicken, but like not really anything else. I was still eating dairy, still eating eggs. And I used to get a lot of migraines. Like I was down and out for like three days at a time, um, just with these horrible migraines. And I went to go see a homeopathic doctor. That's a big thing in Germany where I grew up. And he had suggested, why don't you try cutting out dairy? So I did that <laughs> and it worked. And that was amazing. And I had a lot of skin issues. I had a lot of acne that went away as well. The migraines kind of went away. And I was kind of looking at this being like, hmm, that's interesting. And at the time I started kind of looking up vegetarianism, veganism, and just kind of reading a little bit. And then when I was taking the Metro here in Toronto, when I moved here, I saw a sign in the subway and I think it was from the Toronto Vegetarian Association. And it had, um, I think it was a, a chick, a baby chick on one side and a cat on the other. And it said, why love one and eat another and eat the other. And it, it kind of like, it clicked for me. Like there was just, it, it had never been presented to me in such a way. And I grew up with farm animals. So like I had seen all this stuff, um, which kind of kept me mostly vegetarian for most of my like young adulthood and childhood growing up. And after that, I was like, okay, well, can't unsee that. And I kind of fell down the rabbit hole of, you know, all the the undercover footage in slaughterhouses and all that stuff. And it was that, that was just it for me. So I started uh, learning how to cook because I was a huge foodie. I grew up in Europe for lunch in, uh, or sorry, for dinner in Germany. There's this whole joke about you eat like bread and stuff on it. So a lot of the time it's just like cheese <laughs> um, and like tomatoes and that's it. Um, and so I grew up eating a lot of dairy because that's just how I grew up. My family was from a small farming town in Germany and I liked these things. And I loved when I moved to Canada, all the different types of cuisines. And I just knew that I couldn't stick to this 
starting out if I didn't learn how to cook my favorite foods. So I started doing that. And my mom was like, oh my gosh, can you send me all these recipes? The ladies at church want them. And I got tired of like emailing her and all of her friends all the time, the recipes. So I just threw them up on a blog spot so they could just Mm -hmm. go and grab them. And people started reading. And that's kind of how that started. (laughs) So people- Isn't it amazing? Right, people started coming to the website, they started reading it. And then um, video was just the next natural progression after that, uh, going into YouTube. At the time, I think there was like three, maybe four people doing vegan content. There was Free the, Freely the Banana Girl. Um, another woman, gosh, I don't remember what her name was, but there was two other women that were also doing it. And I was very inspired by them. And it just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, and it, it seems to be going well. Uh, I think we can agree sub- or ob- objectively. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, and I just loaded this so I could grab the, uh, um, proper, uh, data points, 492,000 subscribers on YouTube and 8.1 million uh, followers on Instagram. So that, that, I, I think that is an inarguably it's going well, but how did you then, I think sort of you, you have this very distinct style now, uh, through your books, through your blog, through the Instagram, you you tend to have a way of presenting the food as well as sort of communicating why you're doing things a certain Mm -hmm. way or talking about uh, various other things, sometimes personal, sometimes you get into why you chose one item or one ingredient, sorry, over another ingredient. Uh, How how did that evolve for you from creating, you know, the blog spot so folks could get the recipes and save you a headache (laughs) to you know, this significant sort of style uh, and uh, brand, really. It's a wonderful brand. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. You know what? At the time, there was a lot of raw food vegans um, Mm, and not much else other than that. I mean, in Toronto, we had, um, what was the big one that um, Woody Harrelson used to go to? I think they're still around. Maybe it was called Live. Live. Um, Mm, And then, of course, there was... um, Ruth Tall's place, um, fresh. And Mm -hmm. there wasn't really much other than that. So going out to eat was very difficult. And a lot of the stuff was raw, a lot of it. And a lot of the stuff online was raw. And I mean, we live in Canada, it's effing cold here. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I just, I did that for a bit. um, And it just didn't work for me. It didn't work for me at all. And I didn't like it. I, I, to this day, I don't really love raw food, like the raw food. Obviously I love, raw food raw fruits vegetables are great but the whole like the way that they cook things it's just not for me um Mm. and so i was like okay a i can't eat like this so there's got to be another way b i know other people don't want to eat like this but maybe want to be vegan or vegetarian so there has to be another way and that's kind of the approach that i took was you know i'm not here necessarily for health i'm here for ethics and so Mm you know, let's make cookies and burgers and mac and cheese. And that's kind of the avenue that I took. And then everybody was so serious when they talked about veganism as well. Like it was just all doom and gloom and sadness. And it is very sad, but when you want to reach out kind of like across the aisle to the mainstream viewer, you just can't, you can't go in with that. You can't lead with that. Lead with food, lead Mm -hmm. with a fork. That's always kind of what I said. I have a pretty, I have a strange sense of humor. Some people think I'm funny, some people don't. Um, So I also took that into it as well. And I take a very realistic approach. So I just put a video out on my Instagram that was like, why I don't give a shit about cross-contamination. Yes. And I really thought I was going to put that out because in the past I had put something of that nature out and just got completely roasted because I was not Mm -hmm. vegan enough for vegans and I was too vegan for the average person. So I kind of kept, I would, I would throw things in there and then kind of dial it back and just kind of like, you know, feel it out and see how people went. But that was my approach was just be realistic. I mean, the definition of veganism literally says like within reason, Yep. So that's how I live my life. Kind of preaching, it's not like being vegan isn't about perfectionism. Um, 
you know, for me, being vegan is ethical. So Mm -hmm. if something is cooked on the same grill as beef, for example, if I go to, I don't know, Harvey's or whatever mainstream fast food place, the chicken and the cow doesn't care that it's cooked on the same grill. Yeah. Um, so for me voting with my dollar, if I'm in a place where that is the only option to eat and they have a plant-based item, I'm saying, yes, add more plant-based items. Like I'm not going to make a big stink because realistically, for example, they're not going to add another fryer for the couple of people that order the plant-based option. It's just that it's not realistic and you have to be realistic. So that's the approach that I took. And I think people resonated with that because up until that point, all you heard about was crazy vegans and vegan police and you can mm-hmm. never make them happy. And I think that did make a difference in the vegan world. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I have been vegan myself for about 11 years now. And it, it's one of those things where I could easily say, oh, yeah, I just decided to eat less. And then within two weeks, I was effectively vegetarian. Then within a week, I was vegan. Just as I very quickly learn the exact same as your situation of, OK, well, I've decided to learn more and try. And then you learn more and you go, oh, my, I'm going to try a bit harder and then a bit harder and then eventually get to the point of, OK, just nothing, nothing that was alive and sentient. Let's yeah. draw the line there. Well, and also like approaching it from a not perfectionist point of view. I mean, when I first went vegan and like the amount of guilt I would feel when I would break down and like order a pizza with cheese on it. Like, and yeah. would just beat myself up about it. Why don't you have more willpower? You have to, you have to be compassionate towards people because you weren't always vegan either. Mm-hmm. I mean, very rarely do I meet anyone that's been vegan since birth, for example. So people need their, their hand held a lot of the time and they need that compassion. And I think that at that time, there was really none of that. Yeah. Well, and that's, I, I grew up eating meat and potatoes at every meal, three meals a day for, you know, 20 years. And then on my own, ate meat and potatoes for three <laughs> meals a day for, you know, another 10 years. Um, it was not ideal for my health. That that was very clear. But the positive impacts of, of going into a plant-based diet, it got me cooking again mm-hmm. after kind of giving up on it for a long time and just doing hungry man meals and stuff like that. Uh, and it was, oh, well, I can go and I can buy these ingredients and I can make something or I can take this recipe I used to like and make it vegan somehow. Exactly. And it really got me doing that again, which is enjoyable. Um, well, and that was the thing as well with um, kind of my ethos with it, too, with cooking, because people still to this day will be like, oh, I would love to, but it's so much work. It's so difficult. Like, I don't know what to do. And I always say, OK. Listen, if you didn't like kale before, you're not going to like kale because you're vegan. (laughs) Yeah. So, like, just throw that out the window. Throw out the window the things that you think you should eat as vegan and take your 10 favorite meals that you like to cook. Mm -hmm. And there are probably, luckily now in 2023, there is going to be some sort of substitution for the eggs, the cheese, the milk, the meat. Like, start even with the the store-bought options if you don't want to make it from scratch. Because, like, let's face it, the fact that people think that we should make everything from scratch and not buy things like Impossible or Beyond Meat or Guardian or whatever is insane. Because Mm -hmm. you are not slaughtering that chicken yourself either. So, like, let's relax. You're buying that at a grocery store. So, I always say, like, take your 10 favorite recipes and start veganizing those just by using store-bought substitutions and then go from there like perfect those and then add them and then you'll learn you know what you like and what you don't like and what brands you like and what you don't like Mm -hmm. and then you can use the next five or ten recipes and you just kind of get in the hang of things and you realize it's not it's not more work and a lot of the times i mean given food prices now it's also not more expensive a lot of the time either yeah, it's it's actually gotten a lot more in line, and I've seen some of the the traditional vegan staple products, uh, the prepared ones. The price is actually kind of leveled off when other mm-hmm. produce and meat products have continued to climb in price. And I think that Absolutely. speaks to the fact that there's a stable supply chain and all of this involved with it. Um, uh, and I just wanted to speak and to and a lot to the... more people. Oh, oh go I was ahead. just going to say, and a lot more people are looking for a plant based option. Yeah. Um, now, especially, you know, people like my age who are very conscious about the environment, maybe don't want to go fully vegan, but they're like, you know what? We do like no meat lunches or no meat dinners or no meat or uh, plants or sorry, animal products like three times a week. So even yeah. those people 
are looking for those options and are buying those options, which is awesome. I mean, when the pandemic happened, we ran out of tofu mm -hmm. first. Yep. <laughs> it was hard. Like, right? Yeah. So people that aren't vegan are looking for these products, which makes them more popular, which is great. And then the price can kind of level out. Yeah, for sure. And I, I've definitely seen that as there's been more competition in the market. I mean, sometimes you end up with a crappy product that you don't like or doesn't mm -hmm. cook well. And it's, oh, well, I won't get that one again. But because that one okay. exists, now these other two products prices aren't going to go skyrocketing because they have to remain lower to keep that market share. Um, Absolutely. As terrible as capitalism is, it is somewhat predictable. Um, <laughs> yeah. So speaking to if nothing the, else, it's predictable. Speaking to the uh, the ease of recipes and finding things that everyone will like. So one of your books, Easy Eats, is a staple in my household. It's always on the counter. So your your face has oh, a little bit of a dent in it. I don't think that's going to show up on camera. But then <laughs> when I open it, you will see it automatically falls open. No one else can see this, but it automatically falls open to the gnocchi sausage fest, which and it's the contrast is too great but the page is covered in stains and watermarks and all kinds of things <laughs> i love that a well-used cookbook is a mess oh yeah and and then it falls open to the lasagna recipe so on our grocery list at home it's gnocchi stuff yeah. and the picture of the uh the ingredients and it's just it's they've become staples because they're easy they are hot and warm and it's it's everything i loved eating when i was younger mm in a very accessible way. I mean, I could not have made a lasagna the traditional way to save my life. <laughs> and now I can actually make a delicious lasagna in about half an yeah. hour, which I find remarkable. So thank you for you that. You are very um, welcome. And I mean, in those two staples in your house, when you're grocery shopping, those ingredients are interchangeable. So meal planning, oh, yeah. those meals, you, you buy ingredients that you use throughout the week. So it gets used, which is great. Yeah. And also, I, I find so many of the recipes, there's just two of us that we cook for. And that means there's often leftovers. So mm -hmm. it's we get to buy the ingredient in terms of meal planning, buy the ingredients for the dinner and also reliably get at least two lunches. So yeah. you start doing your, your food pricing math and all of a sudden that's a very good value. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a great one uh, to, to keep around. And I was just at a party where we had the crab dip from your first book. Oh, um, which is one gone in minutes <laughs> like the whole vegans are hoity-toity polite people no it was ravenous um i actually have some bruises on ribs as a result of that crab dip going out onto the you table. know what i bring that crab dip to um like I mean, they're not like potlucks but you know when friends get together and everyone kind of brings a little something for a snack or whatever picnic yeah. i always bring that one and it's always gone first and a lot of the vegan stuff is always gone first I have found that as well. I have I have a group of friends that is vegan and a group of friends that is sort of conjoined to it that is not vegan. And it makes it so easy to get together when mm -hmm. there is stuff that they don't even know isn't vegan exactly. uh, or is vegan. Sorry. It's just this is delicious. What is it? Who brought it? Oh, you guys. Well, what the hell's in it? Um, <laughs> you know, the, the the ongoing conversation. Yes. Um, now, I was going to ask you about being an advocate for plant-based eating, but I think we've established you are. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be something also that you're you're very much uh, proud of. Do you think this becomes... Uh, that sounded flippant. I'm sorry. Uh, I started reading as I finished the <laughs> sentence. So it's something you are very proud of. Uh, is it something that you intentionally did, or is it something that was sort of a side effect of the communication style you have in your branding and across your uh, your channels and books? Yeah, I mean, I think it was intentional. Um, I don't think it started out that way. I think I was trying to find a way to, to eat. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then as I kept seeing things and reading things, watching things, I think it very, very quickly changed. Um, I mean, listen, I always say that, like, if someone has to say they're like, they're empathetic, chances are they probably aren't. Um, but, you know, I grew up, like I said, with farm animals. I grew up in a farming town in Germany. When I moved to Canada, we, we moved to a rural town outside of Ottawa. And there was, our neighbors had farms. And, you know, we went and played with like the sheep and the goats and the mm -hmm. chickens and whatever. So I was always around animals. So I had a great deal of respect for animals already. And 
I, I'm one of those people, like, I can't watch horror movies because I don't do well with, like, blood and gore. It makes me sick. There's a lot of, if anyone needs a trigger warning in shows, it's me. Like, I just, Mm -hmm. I, I absorb that stuff so easily. And so I think when I saw all that stuff, the empathy I already had just became greater because I also, you know, I had dogs and cats growing up too. And the idea that something like that could be done to them, depending on where you are in the world, I just couldn't bear it. And so I think that that's what made me so passionate about it. And I kind of brought people in with the food. And then once they were there, gently relayed the information that I knew. And some people take to it and some people don't and they're just like I just want the food like I don't want to hear about this and that's fine and a lot of the time they get there eventually um and other people are so horrified because they just don't know they they literally just don't know and then they kind of sit with it for a bit and then they come back and they're like thank you for you know sharing this information like this changed my life type thing and that's I think that's the way that I just felt worked. And it's also a way that I could continue to advocate for animals in a way that didn't make me feel horrible all the time. When I first started, I was very militant and I would, you know, I'd I'd go to a lot of these, um, I guess we would call them like protests or whatever. And it just, and I, and I consumed everything that I could consume and all the horrible footage and it just made me miserable. And at this point, I don't watch that stuff anymore. I'm already there. I don't need to. Um, But my advocacy has definitely changed in the approach because of that. And, you know, I, and I don't think that anyone around me, any of my friends and family, even if they don't stop eating meat, they, they still, they recognize it and they can have, they have those moments of pause after, you know, things that I share that are a bit more digestible and aren't like, oh my God, you always post this stuff. I'm going to unfollow or like, I don't want to see this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it started off as like just me needing to eat and then being very, very passionate. And like that kind of happened overnight. <laughs> <laughs> if that, I think that was a long winded way of answering your question. Well, that's, that's the best way to answer a question. Cause it's a journey that we get to go mm-hmm. on together. Um, that was really lame, but it does lead me to another question. Um, I, I so talking, you brought up your cross contamination video. I recently saw one where you talked about soy, um, and you you very rarely have a tone of. Uh, there's very little condens- condensation. Con- no, that's what happens on the window. Condescension. There it yes. is. Um, there is very frequently a, I'm not telling you this because you have to know. And if you don't know, it's a bad thing. It's I'm telling you this. It's just interesting information. It's a very comfortable, easy tone and format to it. Um, Do you think that has an impact on then the follow through? So for example, in the comments on YouTube or Instagram, which can be an interesting place to explore, um, or do you think it's just the way that you speak about it because it works for you and some people really resonate with it? So a lot of those videos actually come from comments, um, those topics, because mm-hmm. people, a lot of the time, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you have this in the comment sections of everything that you do, but people think they have like a gotcha moment. Oh, yeah. And I try to look at comments. I mean, some some people are just trolls and they're dicks and mm-hmm. that's just the way that it is. But sometimes when you really like take the emotion out of reading the comments, you realize that some of these might be genuine questions. They're just asking it in a poor way. So I try to take those comments as a learning experience, as opposed to being like, you're a dick. Um, So a lot of those, there was a hand motion there for listeners. That was (laughs) helpful. (laughs) Angry typing. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, a lot of those topics come from comments that people have left. So I did a a video about, I forget what it was. It was something about, there was another soy video before the, the is soy actually, oh, it was somebody, somebody was saying soy was bad for the planet. Um, And so I did a bit and then someone commented, yeah, but it's also bad for you. And so I took that Mm. and that's why I ended up making the follow-up video. Um, 
And I mean, the MSG video was the same thing. I used MSG yep. in a recipe and people lost their collective minds. And so I did the MSG um, and racism video. Mm. And then again, the cross-contamination video was a brand deal that I did with a large um, fast food chain. And then people were losing their minds in the comment section about that. And that's where that topic came from. So again, the same way that I kind of said that I lead with a fork and I lead with food to kind of bring people in, I really try to not be condescending and just genuinely answer the question because even if they didn't mean it in a genuine way and the question or the comment was to be a dick, at least other people will see the video that might have the same question genuinely. So that's yeah. kind of how I handle that. And then, you know, I also have my moments where I'm kind of a dick in comments too. <laughs> <laughs> You could only put up with so much before sometimes you just need to say, hey, 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 hey don't be a dick, guys. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of a don't be a dick rule being implemented strongly. Mm -hmm. um, and talking about that, though, there are barriers to uh, getting into a plant based lifestyle. Um, and there, you know, we, we discussed that the food prices aren't going up necessarily at the same uh, rates, the, the exponential rate of other foods, but they are going up. And if yeah. you are someone who likes to cook a lot of your own food, 50 cents here and there on celery or carrots or whatever, it really, really adds up. Oh my gosh, I did a food delivery. I don't drive. Um, mm. And with the shoots every week, it's a ton of food. So I can't really like walk there and back. Um, so I do a food delivery every week and I needed an eggplant in it. Food Basics eggplant was $12. Have you wow. ever heard of such a thing in your entire life? <laughs> That's crazy. Like talking about food prices is just friggin' crazy right now. So I get it. I get why people think like, oh my God, that's going to be so expensive. Especially when, I mean, you can get really cheap crappy ground beef for like three bucks. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a really high quality, uh, you know, I think it might move a little when you open it type stuff. Right. <laughs> Well, I do. So I do a, a segment or not a segment, but um, my, I did a couple different topics on the YouTube channel for a bit. And then I did one video that was like dirt cheap, like broke meals for hot girls or something like that. And it was three yeah. different recipes for dinners that were like dirt, dirt, dirt cheap, but were still like super, super tasty. They looked great. And then that took off and people were like, oh my God, we're so broke. The world is on fire. Like, please do more of these recipes. So on the YouTube channel, those are the only videos I've been doing now. So it's like three broke girl or boy um, breakfasts or like three broke desserts mm -hmm. and, and just taking things that we have been telling people when that conversation comes up where they're like, but it's so expensive. And you know how people in the comments will be like, rice and beans are cheap. Okay, yeah. that's not like I get what you're saying, but like help them. So I'm taking those. <laughs> so I'm taking those ingredients: dried beans, dried lentils, rice, dried pasta, and actually showing you how to use them in a way that isn't just like brown or a chili. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's very helpful, too. I got to say, as someone who, as I said, I can cook, I can follow recipes quite well, but if you give me four ingredients and say, make a meal, you're getting those four ingredients mixed together on a plate <laughs> with, like, salt. I think a lot of people are like that. Yeah, the first video that went out was uh, black bean and sweet potato enchiladas, and then the um, a cheap version, I mean, the lasagna in the book that you love so much is already, like, mm. pretty cheap but an even cheaper version of that using lentils, for example. Um, and I forget yep. what the third one was now. Oh, it was a um, Alfredo sauce also using beans. So using those ingredients in an interesting way where it's still like your macros and everything are still there. It's high in protein. Um, it, it, it's using ingredients that like don't need to look the way that they come in the dried bag like the sauce for example and just kind of yep. trying to inspire people to think of these ingredients in a different way while also saving money and i think i cut you off there sorry <laughs> oh i i have i don't remember that was 45 <laughs> seconds ago you know how it is yep. whatever that was is just gone in the universe's ether ethers um this is a conversation with two people with adhd <laughs> mm -hmm. it's fun. and i'm in a tent too uh, people can't see that's that's that helps with the sound that also helps with my fuck <laughs> I can't see anything around me uh, although I do have my fidgety things in front of me just in case um, 
Actually, that's a curious question. As someone with ADHD, let's let's go that direction. Mm -hmm. I am terrible at eating. I barely eat all yeah. day, and then I'm cranky and I'm a jerk. And then I overstuff myself with like three meals worth of food at once. Yep. Um, and then at ten or eleven, it's gee, do we have any chocolate or salt around? I'm literally the exact same way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I'm also on, because I, I have my medication for ADHD, there's mm -hmm. two that I'm on, um, I really don't eat. So I just, you know when people talk about hyper-focused meals, and you know how mm -hmm. other people always say, like, chefs, not that I'm calling myself a chef, I'm more of a home cook, but chefs eat, like, they cook gorgeous, beautiful food for other people, and then they go home and eat like a toddler, it's a combination of those two things. So I, <laughs> yeah. a lot of the time I take like toddler-ish type meals or foods and I just figure out an easy way to make them a hyper-focused meal or like a, yeah, a hyper-focused meal for like um, a hyper-fixation meal for like a week at a time, two weeks at a time. And I eat that same thing until it makes me sick to look at it. And then I mm -hmm. go on to the next thing. And a lot of the time it's things like, buying veggie nuggets or making like veggie nuggets out of tofu and throwing it into like a salad that's romaine, a dressing that I make that's a vegan version of Caesar, um, throw a bunch of nooch on there, like some some um, white beans and just kind of like a bunch of stuff from my fridge. And then I eat that for like a week straight as like a lunch. Yeah. And because I really like veggie nuggets and sometimes I toss them in like buffalo sauce for example and then throw them in the salad because it's and I love Caesar salad so it's, it's two things that I really like it makes it less difficult to like force a meal down so if I have yes. to force a meal down at lunch which I do because I'm on medication that makes it impossible for me to eat at least it's things that I like and it makes it a lot easier I also always prep yeah so not necessarily like meal prep even, just I prep the things that I know I'm going to have. So, you know, I wash and tear all the romaine lettuce for the week, for example. So it's like simple mm -hmm. things like that. And then for breakfast, I mean, I'm not a huge breakfast person, but it's the same type of things like I, my mother's German, my dad is English. So like baked beans and toast, beans on toast was like just the thing that we had growing up. And it's easy. I can either take them from a can or make a huge batch and freeze them. And it's the same type of thing, just like having them on hand, making it things that are easy to eat. And I really try to eat my breakfast before I take my meds too. And then at night, honestly, sometimes I think about it this way. I don't eat a lot during the day. So if I binge like half a box of cookies or like a chocolate bar at night, it's not a huge deal. I need calories. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the way that I look at it. I've become very... Um, compassionate towards myself because I used to beat myself up about this and I just yeah. kind of I, I cycle through things I mean another one that I do all the time is ramen so I take like yeah. Mr. Noodles or whatever ramen brand and I shove it full of veggies and I take a little flavor packet and I make a broth out of it I'll add like soy milk to make it creamy and sesame seed oil and I just kind of make it a convenience food but healthy yeah. <laughs> and quick <laughs> Unfortunately, the last several minutes of our conversation was lost due to a power outage. But I had a lovely time talking with Candace and encourage everyone to check out her Instagram and YouTube channels under Edgy Veg. I also strongly recommend any of Candace's cookbooks, particularly for anyone who has a meat lover looking to get more plant based. You can find them online at theedgyveg.com, wherever good books are sold, or at your local library. What inspired you to become plant based or vegan? Let me know in the comments on the post for this episode on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by searching for The Fur Bearers. You can also find me directly on Instagram at Howie Michael. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and The Fur Bearers, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong. Stay strong.